Well, good morning, church. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord today, this Communion Sunday, as we've heard? My name is Kester. I'm one of the elders here, and uh, it's my privilege to be able to continue the series in uh, Character Counts that started last week. If you were here last week, you'd have heard Pastor Jason Morris share about the life of Abraham and his character and how that points us to the Lord Jesus. And today, we're going to continue this series by looking at the life of Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis. And in coming weeks, we'll have Roslyn Jackson sharing on the life of David and Mike Beard and Michael Walls. So we have a lot to look forward to this summer before Pastor Jacob comes back in August. So I'm not sure if any of you are royal watchers. I don't know if you like people who follow the news about the Great Britain and the, you know, obviously the passing of the Queen, but then uh, here you can see Prince Harry and Prince William. If you know anything about it, and I, I confess I don't know a lot, but I do know that there has been a, uh, a breakdown in the relationship between these two brothers. Um, there's been a, a conflict that's, that's very sad to see. There's... There seems to be they're no longer talking to each other. They no longer uh, spend time together. There's some people call it a royal feud or a royal rift. And, you know, I don't know the reasons for this family crisis, but when we see this kind of thing, it is very sad, isn't it? There's this bitterness. There's, there's, um, there's a breakdown. And, and our hearts go out to people like that. And if we look at the Bible, we also see... Uh, rifts or feuds like this also, especially in the book of Genesis. I mean, God said after the fall that there would be conflict. He said there'd be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the devil, but he also promised a child would come. He'd send a child, a seed, who would come and he'd crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 15, and he would bring peace. Ultimately, he would bring peace. Now, I'm sure that Adam and Eve... Uh, hoped that peacemaker would come soon. Uh, they would have uh, hoped that, that, that this, this would end, this sort of conflict would end soon. But one of the first things we see in Genesis after they leave the garden is that Cain kills his younger brother Abel. This is family conflict of the worst possible kind, isn't it? It's tragic. And later in Noah, we see conflicts with his uh, son and, and then his, um, Ham and Canaan, his grandson. So when we come to Abraham, we have new hope. God speaks to Abraham in Genesis 12, and he makes a promise to him, makes a covenant. He'll give him children. He'll give him uh, land and blessings. And so there's this new hope. It's restored. But then again, the promise is threatened, isn't it? Because the older son, Ishmael, mocks his younger brother, Isaac, and Ishmael sent away. And then later, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, gets pregnant, and she has two boys, Jacob and Esau. And they start fighting even in the womb. They're not even born, and they start fighting each other, don't they? We just wonder, is there ever going to be an end to this kind of conflict? When will the peacemaker come? When will there be harmony between brothers? Who can bring resolution to this conflict. So today we're going to look at some of the key events in Joseph's life, and we're going to see how in many ways Joseph provides an answer to this problem. As God works in Joseph's life to shape him and to mould him, and to mould his character, we bring, we see resolution to the conflict. Where there was rejection, we see reconciliation. So God has a plan. God has a plan to bring the promised seed and also to bring peace between Brothers. So, as we trace the story of Joseph today, we're going to look at three key areas in his life. First, we're going to see how Joseph resists temptation. He's, he's a man of virtue, he fights off sin. Secondly, we're going to see how he relieves the distress of the needy. He's a man of compassion. And then finally, we're going to see how he reconciles broken relationships. He's a man of peace. And all of this and all these events in Joseph's life, we're going to see that Joseph is assured of God's plan. God's plan. His, and, and God, he knows God is ruling over everything. And his life points to something greater. 
points to someone greater. So before we um, get into the story, let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for the book of Genesis. We want to thank you for the life of Joseph. And we pray today that as we open your word and look into it, you would speak to us. Speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Help us see what's in there for us that we can live out and, and bring uh, transformation and change for us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, Joseph's father, Jacob, had a special love for him. He, Joseph was the son of Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife. And Jacob gave Joseph a special robe, special clothes, that showed that he was special. He was the heir. He was the one who was going to receive the promise. But when his brothers, here in Genesis 37, if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open. We're going to look from Genesis 37 through to Genesis 50 today, kind of skim through. When his brothers saw that their father loved him, that's Joseph, more than all his brothers, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably to him. Now, favoritism often leads to conflict, doesn't it? We're very quick to notice if, uh, if something isn't fair. And Joseph doesn't help the situation. Joseph, maybe he's a bit naive, maybe he's, uh, he's insensitive, but he tells his father these bad reports about his brothers. He said his brothers are doing bad things. And then he tells his, them all about these dreams he's had. He's had these dreams. And he tells them in the dreams, one day they're all going to bow down to him. Now this makes them even more angry. So when his father sends Joseph to go and see how the brothers are getting on, looking after the sheep far away... They're ready. They plan to kill him. And they, and they strip off his clothes, and they, the robe that symbolizes his, um, his beloved status, and they put blood on the robe, and they throw him into a pit. Now, a bit later, they change their minds and decide, oh, we won't kill him, we'll sell him into slavery in Egypt. But for them, Joseph is effectively dead. And there's another round of family conflict, another round of bitterness and fighting. And the promised seed looks to be lost. But even as a slave, God shows favour to Joseph, doesn't he? In his master's house, Potiphar in Egypt, everything Joseph does is successful. But things are about to get more difficult for Joseph. And we read in Genesis 39 verse 6, it says, This Potiphar left all he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and it came to pass over these, after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. So even as a slave, Joseph's been elevated, but now he meets this temptation. We can see here some of the dangers of power, can't we? Some of the dangers of, of success, of status, of good looks. There's, these are attractive to people and, and they can cause great temptation, can't it? Joseph has been through a lot. He's had a difficult time. Now he's made it. Now he's successful. He could think here, well, you know, I've had a difficult time. Maybe I should just enjoy the benefits of my new position. Maybe he could have a sense of entitlement. Maybe he could think, you know, the world owes me something for what I've been through. Often sin is the path of least resistance. You almost don't have to do anything to fall into sin. Joseph here would be so easy for him to fall into sin. He's a slave and the mistress of the house is chasing after him. He's under great pressure to sin. Maybe you've experienced something like this in your life. Maybe you've had orders from your boss to do something that was against your conscience. Maybe there was pressure to, to maybe you know join karaoke sessions and, and drink too much, or maybe you've been asked to pay a bribe, maybe you've um, been asked to fiddle the books as an accountant or something. I, I've worked in construction here in Vietnam, I've seen those things, and it's, you know, the superiors, the culture can push you uh, towards sin very easily. Just think how easy it would be here for this marriage to be destroyed rather than protected and saved. So what happens? Well, we see that in verse 8 it says, But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. 
There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? No, Joseph is a man of character, isn't he? Joseph resists sin. To resist is hard. It takes effort. But notice how he views it. Not just as a sin against Potiphar and his master or his his wife, but it's a sin against God. That's really how we need to identify sin, isn't it? It's not just hurting others, but it is, but it is a transgression of the law of God. What Joseph is most concerned about here is what God thinks. That's what sets him apart. That's the backbone of Joseph's character in this story, I think. He knows God's will. He wants God's will. So even before the Ten Commandments were given to Israel, Joseph knew what adultery was and he knew it was bad. He knew he hated it. So Joseph flees from Potiphar's wife. He flees from temptation and he leaves his robe behind. See, he keeps losing his clothes in verse 39, uh, chapter 39, verse 11. But Joseph here is being tested. See, great things are in front for Joseph. To serve God successfully, he would need to resist sin. And in resisting sin, resisting temptation, we hear, we see Joseph is the opposite to Adam and Eve, isn't he? Our first parents, they listened to the temptation and they fell. They should have run from the devil. They should have fought against his lies. But here we see a difference between Joseph is a man of character, a man of virtue, a man who feared God. So he passed the test. Joseph's success here, though, looks ahead, doesn't it? It looks to a greater victory against sin. Remember how the Lord Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil three times to use his power wrongfully, he resists. He's, he's tempted, but he, he says no. He turns back to God's word and he, he, he resists the devil. And he also passed the test. But he doesn't just pass the test for himself, he passed the test for us also. So Jesus' righteousness there becomes our righteousness. Now, when Potiphar heard about what had happened, he threw Joseph into prison. Now imagine how Joseph felt there in prison. I mean, he's he's fought against sin, he's conquered sin, but what has it achieved? We see here how righteousness, a life of righteousness, can actually lead to suffering. It can lead to unjust treatment. It can lead to being mocked. I wonder if you've ever had anyone say to you, or he had anyone say to him, don't worry, God has a wonderful plan for your life. You know? Have you ever had someone to say that when you're struggling and things are going badly? You go, don't worry, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Sometimes it can be very hard to believe. And it's true, though. God does have a wonderful plan, But often we don't tell the whole story. We leave out a key part of the story. God's wonderful plan is to sanctify you. It's to purify you. It's to refine you through trials and tribulations. Look what Peter says in 1 Peter. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why he's suffering. That's why Joseph's suffering. This wonderful plan isn't like a a carefree life, we just feed up by the pool, sipping a cool drink. No, his plan is to make us holy. His plan is to make us like Jesus. That was very painful for Joseph, and it can be very painful for us but we can rejoice as we participate in the suffering of our Lord Jesus because it's for his glory and it's for his honour and his praise. And so that is the most wonderful plan there is. But we do see like this great irony in the Christian life, don't we? We see, we see it in Joseph, we see it in other characters in the Bible, we see it in King David. It's an inverted life, isn't it? It's an upside-down kingdom. Because often the way, the way up is the way down. The way that we find life is the way is to die to ourself. The way to be clothed is to be stripped naked. And we experience this in our lives because that is what the Lord Jesus' life looked like. Remember how he gave up his glory. He stepped down into this world, he gave up his royal robes, and he took on human flesh. And then he went down further. He was numbered with the transgressions, a sinner, accused of being a sinner, a criminal. 
So Joseph's life is tracking the, the humiliation of our Lord and Master. Now moving to the second major part of Joseph's life. Thankfully, Joseph does not stay in prison, does he? The way down is the way up. Humiliation comes before exaltation. So God providentially places a butler and a baker of the Pharaoh of Egypt in the prison with Joseph. And they have these dreams, and Joseph interprets their dreams. Now, the butler forgets about this after he's freed, and, but later, some years later, Pharaoh has a dream. He has this dream. After two whole years, it says here in Genesis 41, after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. So he sees this dream. He says, seven fat cows, are, and they are eaten by seven thin cows. And he sees seven fat stalks eaten by seven thin stalks. And Pharaoh says, what, what does this mean? He asks his advisors, what does this mean? No one knows. Then the butler remembers Joseph. He says, oh, I know someone who can interpret dreams. So Joseph is brought out of prison. And in verse, chapter 41, verse 14, he's clothed. He's clothed. This is a, remember, he lost his clothes twice. Now he's clothed. And this is a turning point for Joseph. Everything turns around from here. He's brought before Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at that time, and Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream. He says there's going to be seven years of plenty, of prosperity, and there's going to be seven years of famine. A great crisis is coming to Egypt. God is warning them that if they don't prepare, don't plan ahead, they will starve. So Pharaoh recognises this man as their saviour. He says... He says to his servants, and Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? So from the pit, Joseph is raised up to be second only to Pharaoh. Suddenly he's one of the most influential people on the planet. So remember God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12? In that covenant, he said he would bless the nations through Abraham and through his offspring. So now God is keeping that promise. He had a plan all along. God's orchestrated all of these events. The dreams, Joseph being sold into Egypt, the, the accusations, prison. But Joseph's character needed to be shaped by suffering. He needed to be proven faithful before he could be given this kind of responsibility. It's a huge responsibility, isn't it? So when the terrible famine came, when it strikes the land, he's ready. Joseph has stored food and can save the world from disaster. But back in Canaan, Jacob and his sons are getting hungry. They're going to die if they don't get food. Where can they find relief? So the end of Genesis 41 into 42, it says, So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, because the famine was severe in all the lands. Now when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? I can just imagine <laughs> they're all sitting there looking at one another, not knowing what to do. And he said, Indeed, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there, that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold all the people of the land. Sold, sorry, sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and they bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. So we see God's plan coming about, don't we? His ten brothers come and bow before him. Only he can save them. Only he can meet their need. As they bow down before him, it's just like in the dream. God has appointed Joseph for this time. Now we need Joseph's today, don't we? We need Joseph's in our own nations. We need Joseph's in, here in Vietnam. We need them in our, in our businesses where we work. We need people with foresight, people with mercy, with compassion, people of character. We need them in the, in the new empires of today, don't we? Think about the, 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 the powerful organisation in the world, people like Apple or Samsung or Meta or Tencent. We need to pray that God will raise up Joseph's in organisations like that. Because leadership in these organisations, in, 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 in business and in nations, it's not wielding power for ourselves. Remember how Joseph, uh, Pastor Jacob Several weeks ago, on a series about leadership, he talked about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. 
So leadership is really about service, isn't it? Joseph is like a, he's a public servant. He's like the minister of agriculture. And the word minister means servant. That comes from the, 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 the word for servant. So Joseph's been called to serve God in a foreign country, far from home. Initially, he didn't want to go there. Initially, he was taken against his will. But now he sees his role as to serve God in Egypt. He sees God's plan. Joseph is there to bless the nations, to bring relief to the poor and to feed the hungry. Now, for us today, maybe none of us are in a high position like Joseph, but in many ways, we're all like little Josephs, aren't we? We're all like little Josephs. We're far from home. We're called to live with character, with integrity, to show mercy, to serve those around us. That is God's plan for your life and for my life. We should live that out with joy. But for some of us, we might feel like we're still in the pit. We're still in prison. God, we're being tested. We're being going through different trials. But God is refining you. He's preparing you for some greater task. It's only after we pass through that trial and we resist the temptations that he can bring us into something greater. But ultimately, in Joseph's life, in Joseph's role as a saviour of the nations, what we really see here is a picture of the Lord Jesus, don't we? It's only the Lord Jesus who can really bring relief to the hungry. Only he can really truly feed us and sustain us. Only he's worthy to bow down to, isn't he, in worship. Only he's the most powerful king. And like Joseph, when the nations come to him, he can rescue them with bread that never perishes, his own body. Remember what Jesus says when he speaks about the manna in in John chapter 6. He says... I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the whole world. So Jesus' body can feed the hungry. It can give us life. And later, today, we're going to take communion. And as we take communion, we can remember that, that as we we come as hungry people, as people who need to be fed, and we feed on the Lord Jesus by faith, don't we? Not, not just by our mouth, but spiritually he nourishes us, he feeds us, and he promised to give us eternal life. And moving to the last major part of Joseph's life, it says, so Joseph's brothers come down and bow before him, but they don't recognize Joseph. They don't know who he is because he uses an interpreter. He pretends he doesn't speak Hebrew. I don't know if any of you have ever done that. Pretend you don't understand a language and people are speaking, you understand what's going on. He's listening to every word that they say. He's looking, have they changed? Are there signs of repentance? Are they sorry for what they did? He says, he accuses them, he says, you're spies. Your spies come to spy out the land. Will Joseph take revenge here? Nothing would be easy. He could just crush them, couldn't he? Just crush them, it'd be so easy. On the third day, it says in Genesis 42, it says, on the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you, are in custody, where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your household and bring your youngest brother to me. Youngest brother, it's Benjamin, his, his full brother, right? And so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. So it's good news, isn't it? He gives them food. Though he does keep Simeon in prison, and he says, but he says to them, You won't get more food until you bring my brother or bring Joseph Benjamin to me in Egypt. So nine brothers, they go back to their father and they report everything that's happened. Even the money was returned in their sacks. They're kind of mystified by that. But Jacob, he won't let them go back. He's afraid that he's going to lose Benjamin also. But as time goes by, the food runs out and they get hungry, and maybe they're going to starve again. It's only after Judah promises to be responsible for Benjamin that he lets them go back, go back to Egypt. So the tension mounts. The brothers come back into Egypt. Again, they bow before Joseph. Will he take revenge now? Remember the the conflicts that we've seen so far in Genesis. Remember Cain killed Abel. Ishmael mocked Isaac. Jacob fought with Esau. Joseph's elder siblings believe they've killed their younger brother. These cycles of hatred, of anger, jealousy repeated throughout the book. 
And that's not against enemies, remember? That's not against enemies. It's like your own flesh and blood brother. Will it happen again? In this climactic scene in Genesis 45, the brothers, they've got their food and they're heading back, leaving home, and then Benjamin is discovered to have Joseph's cup of divination. He's accused of stealing from Joseph, and they're all forced to return back and stand before Joseph, terrified. Judah speaks up. He offers to take the place of Benjamin. He will bear the punishment for Benjamin instead. What will Joseph do? And Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Going on, it says, And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. So they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Amazingly, wonderfully, isn't it? Joseph breaks this cycle of revenge. This, I think, is one of the greatest scenes in all of world literature. There's this beautiful reconciliation between these warring brothers. Peace is made where there was once hatred. Only God's providence could do this. Joseph sees God's sovereign rule over all of history, over all details in men's life. He says, God sent me ahead to save you. Joseph can do what he does here. He can forgive them because he knows that God is in control. That's the backbone of his character. That's the basis for his forgiveness. He knows God's will. He wants God's will. He wants, God's, he, he wants what God's plan is. He sees things as God sees them, not as man sees them. But sadly, we know that family conflict doesn't actually end here, does it? The Bible has other examples of conflict. Think of Gideon's sons or David's sons, Amnon, Tamar and Absalom. There's some tragic stories that follow. So Joseph's story isn't the greatest story. It's really just a small picture, a tiny little glimpse of the ultimate reconciliation that we've all been waiting for. The Lord Jesus, rejected by his brothers, stripped of his clothes, beaten, taken to the cross. But even hanging on the cross, he knew who was in control, didn't he? As he said, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So his shame, his humiliation, his death, and then his resurrection, his exaltation, that's what brings true reconciliation, true peace, lasting peace. What was shattered by the first Adam is renewed and restored in the last Adam. So we can look at this though and say, well, there's still challenges for us though, isn't there? I mean, I'm sure some of you have suffered conflict in your families. You've maybe seen bitterness, separation, divorce even. And some of us have hurt others, haven't we? We've, we've, we've been the abusers. We've done things to hurt others. And sometimes we think, there can't be forgiveness. I can't be forgiven for the things I've done. Sometimes we doubt God's mercy. We doubt his grace, don't we? So after Jacob dies, his brothers are afraid. His brothers think Joseph might still take revenge. They aren't quite sure. So they come to him and they say, you know, just before he died, Dad had one last wish. He said, Joseph, don't punish us. Don't, don't, let, don't punish us. What is Joseph's response to that? In chapter 50, verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to save many people, uh, to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spoke kindly to them. 
Joseph doesn't hold on to his pain, does he? Some people do that. He can give this false kind of strength or power to hold on to it. But no, he comes with a humble, forgiving spirit. He's sure of God's plan. He has a heart of reconciliation. And that resolves all the problems, doesn't it? Undones all the tensions of this book. So Joseph's story is not just like an add-on to the end of, end of the book. It really brings it to a fitting close. It shows how the sin that our first parents committed can be undone by one who fully obeys God's command, a virtuous man. Someone who resists temptation, fights temptation, they can bring reconciliation. But that isn't us, is it? That's not us. We can resist, we can try to fight sin, but only Jesus can fully resist sin and conquer Satan. And it also reminds us how God keeps his promises. Remember his promise to Abraham that he would be a blessing to the nations and from him would come someone who would bless the nations. A man of mercy, a man of compassion, a man of wisdom. That was foreshadowed in Joseph, but it was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the only one who can really meet our needs. And ultimately, it also reminds us of the need of a man of peace. From rejection, we can bring reconciliation in the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus reconciles us, heals relationships. So in all of this, we see that God is fully in control. He is sovereign over human affairs. He's at the center. He's arranging events down to their finest detail. And now the Lord Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, doesn't he? So as we come to him, as we bow down in repentance, as we acknowledge our sin, as we acknowledge our rebellion, we do not, we do not need to be afraid. Like Joseph says, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them. See, the Lord Jesus comforts us and he speaks kindly to us. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for the life of Joseph, Lord. We want to thank you that you have used that, brought that about to show us more deeply who the Lord Jesus is and what he's done for us. And we want to thank you for, for that privilege. It is to be your children in a, in a family that's reconciled, Lord, in your church, in your people, Lord. Reconciled to you as our Father, reconciled to our brothers and sisters around us. And so we want to thank you for that. And we pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.